Seattle has experienced high levels of economic growth over the past few decades fueled by the tech industry. Seattle is one of the fastest growing cities in the United States, with its population increasing by more than 17% since 2000. While this growth has been good for the city as a whole, this population growth has driven up the demand for housing and with it, housing prices. These shifts in demand can result in varying degrees of change in supply. As the price of housing increases, developers are incentivized to construct new housing and existing owners are encouraged to sell, increasing the supply of available housing. While we see new housing being built in Seattle, the market remains sluggish. Supply is slow to react to the change in prices due to the fact that building new development is very time intensive. Land prices are often extremely high or land is just not available. All of these factors can shift the supply curve left. That means that the large changes in quantity demanded result in small shifts in quantity supply. This creates a shortage in the housing market because the slow increase in the supply of housing is getting outstripped by the large increase in demand. The shortage is driving more and more middle income families out of the center of the city and starting a new wave of gentrification that is threatening to display a lot of low income families. My name is Jeff Wentland and uh, I'm strategic advisor here in the City of Seattle's Office of Planning and Community Development. So clearly it's going to be the most successful in a neighborhood that has amenities and services because the space that someone's living in and, and the building doesn't have as, as much, you know, as much of those things, you know, in the housing unit, you know, like you're going to need to have to, you might not even want to cook in your apartment that much because you only have a, you don't even have a full stove. You probably usually have a microwave and a, and a mm -hmm. small fridge and a, you know, a smallish sink. So you're going to want to, you know, go out to eat um, a lot, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you don't have a lot of open space in your unit. You're probably going to want to go out and have a park you can go to. Mm -hmm or coffee shops and things you can spend time in. Yeah. Well, advantages are um, a lower cost housing option mm -hmm. um, to have more people be able to access um, amenities, you know, transit, parks, um, so density in the right places is, is very efficient. You know, mm -hmm. because you can, more people can enjoy the public investments that we make. Um, you know, disadvantages are, um, you know, really just community-based concerns, which sometimes are and sometimes are not valid, but, you know, in this case, um, you know, perceptions, community-based perceptions of, um, you know, too much density, you know, parking impacts, you know, those are the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we heard is that uh, these, this housing is really good for people who are in transitions, hmm. including, you know, people moving here from, you know, out of state or other areas of the country, where you might not want to just commit to a 12-month lease right away, or, you know, you have, you know, three weeks or a month to relocate for your job, and you need to find a place that's temporary. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> there was a lot of that. Um, also, people going through life changes, like you know, people who are you know going through a divorce and you know mm -hmm. need a temporary place to live. So we heard that. Mm -hmm. The high cost of housing. It's a huge issue. It's a you know huge issue that the city's working on. Mayor mm -hmm. Murray is really committed to making progress on housing affordability. And rents have been rising a lot, uh, we know that. <clears throat> and so this is a lower, you know, microhousing has been a lower cost option. Mm -hmm. um, at the time we were doing the, the work, um, microhousing was renting for, you know, you know, around 600 $650 f 
for a, for a unit at the same time that a typical one bedroom apartment was renting for like $1,100. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely an affordability factor there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the features of micro housing were that you don't have to sign a 12 month lease. In fact, you can sign a, you know, usually it was a six month lease and then go month to month. And they also had um, a lot of nice conveniences like all of your, the utilities and internet within the lease. So if you're moving from another part of the country, you mm -hmm. can get off the plane with your yeah. with your luggage and you're all set up and good to go. And hmm. a lot of them even included um, furnishings. Seattle so is definitely at the forefront of this. And it's mostly because we didn't make them illegal. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not really anything that this the city or the city planning department did that was brilliant to like encourage these. It was we didn't have the certain rules in place to make them illegal, and they kind of thrived in this gray area in the code a little bit. And um, when we passed regulations, you know, we we passed some. Some modest new regulations on on it, but you know wanted to continue to allow them to happen. Um, one of the things that Seattle has right now is uh, a lot of the new development is um, not just micro housing. It's not just micro housing, mm -hmm. but also a lot of one smallish one bedroom apartments yeah. and. That's really the vast majority of what's getting built right now. Mm, a lot of growth up, sort of. Yeah, and there's, building. I mean, you could have two or three bedroom units, mm -hmm. um, but we're just seeing right now that um, the vast majority of new units is, are, are, are one bedrooms or smaller. And I think, you know, there's a question about whether that's. Uh, a lot of that's responding to the market. You know, we have over 40% of the city's households are single-person households. So there are a lot of single-person single, single person households out there. People want to mm -hmm. kind of live uh, on their own these days. Um, you know, so there's some question about, you know, whether this is kind of an ongoing trend towards, you know, single-person households. It was interesting because one of the main reasons was um, just some innovative developers and micro housing really started in Seattle around 2008 when the economy was really bad and mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't much going on in the housing in the housing market. There wasn't a lot of housing being built at all. And um, a group or a couple of creative developers kind of discovered that even in this very kind of low market for residential development, there was a need for um, you know, low cost living um, for singles and you know single person households in Seattle, and that was kind of one one market that um, they found a really kind of innovative way to to cater to, which is basically renting bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, the micro housing started in Seattle as essentially, you know, a rented individual sleeping room or bedroom within a kind of a, a larger apartment or within a, a group of up to eight bedrooms within a, within a unit with a shared kitchen. And at that time, the city allowed for um, any kind of dwelling unit to have up to eight uh, bedrooms in it and eight unrelated people. So these mm -hmm. creative developers just started renting rooms for eight um, individuals mm -hmm. within a single dwelling unit. And that was really that really took off, and they discovered that they were able to to develop that type of housing even in a very, very low market. So that's kind of the how it how it started. The city you really wanted to support micro housing. So we mm -hmm. wanted to respond to local community concerns and also kind of support this new innovative housing type because it's very consistent with a lot of the city's policies. Um, if it's in the right place, like in an urban village, you know, near mm -hmm. transit, near other services. So um, yeah, the, the city really 
wanted to support and allow micro housing to, to flourish. So from our perspective, that's great. We always look at our comprehensive plan, you know, other policies that we have, uh, and micro housing is consistent with those in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. There was a big reaction to those kind of that group of creative developers and this mm -hmm. model of you know eight unrelated individuals living in a single housing sure. unit. Um, a lot of pushback by local community groups, mm -hmm. feeling like that was more density, you know, more more people living in a smaller uh, area than they expected, mm -hmm. and. Um, a lot of our work over the last few years was to figure out how to kind of appropriately regulate micro housing and respond to those real neighborhood based concerns, uh, but at the same time not kind of kill off this you know really innovative type of housing that there was clearly a demand for. Mm -hmm. Um, parking is one of the major concerns that, mm -hmm. that we heard. So Seattle doesn't require parking with new development for residential within what what are called designated urban villages. Those are the places that the city is trying to encourage and focus growth. So you could have a micro housing building be developed with say you know thirty six rooms in it or even more mm -hmm. um, and not have any parking be required and so that was a huge complaint by a lot of neighborhood based groups and then just kind of the um, concerns about the livability of the units mm -hmm. you know some mm -hmm. of the units are very small you know getting down to under 300 square feet so some community members felt like maybe there were livability concerns with, with units that small Well, some neighborhoods have just seen more growth than others, and mm -hmm. um, the neighborhoods that have seen the most growth are like neighborhoods like Capitol Hill, East Lake, um, Ballard. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's a number of factors, but mm -hmm. certainly one of those factors is um, accessibility to transit. Mm -hmm. You know, walkability. Like a lot of the walkable neighborhoods are. Um, some of the ones that have seen the most growth. So there's, yeah. there's kind of, I mean, this is something that people in planning are talking about a lot, is that you know, a, a livable, walkable neighborhood is a desirable neighborhood, and that's where you know, rents are higher, because you know, people want to hmm. you know, live in those neighborhoods as an amenity. So hmm. and that's yeah. pretty clear in what we're seeing in Seattle yeah. right now. I don't think demographically any, anyone's really expecting that this trend towards um, you know single person households in cities is going to decrease anytime soon. I mean, when this batch of millennials you know moves to a different stage of life, you know, presumably there's going to be another batch of um, you know single person households that everything's pointing to that those households want to be in cities. Mm -hmm. While microhousing isn't a universal solution to nationwide housing issues, Seattle provides an environment for success. A large set of amenities, high cost of living, and interest from the community allows microhousing to become established in Seattle. With appropriate code currently in place, microhousing provides a short-term solution to alleviating the high cost of living by providing affordable housing in desirable locations. In addition to consumer demand, this option is also attractive to developers due to the high rent per square foot ratio as compared to conventional housing. While this housing option could be an immediate influence on the housing market, it is likely not an effective long-term housing solution for Seattle.